let's wrap up our discussion of uh, risk and return by talking about the CAPM and SML. So CAPM is the capital asset pricing model and it links the risk and required return. So it suggests that there is this thing called a security market line or the SML that states that a stock's required return is equal to, so required return in this formula is RI, is equal to the risk-free return, RRF, plus a risk premium that reflects the stock's risk after diversification. So the risk premium is RM minus RRF. It's the difference between the market return and the risk-free rate, but the amount of that premium that's allocated to a particular stock's return is determined by that stock's beta, or the riskiness after diversification. So that means the relevant riskiness of a stock is its, contribu is its contribution to the riskiness of a well-diversified portfolio. So let's talk about that new risk measure of beta. Beta measures a stock's market risk and shows a stock's volatility relative to the market. So it's going to show how that stock's returns move with market returns. So it indicates how risky a stock is if that stock is held in a well-diversified portfolio. So beta is another one of these measures like correlation uh, that is standardized, meaning that um, it tends to range between plus and minus one. So if a beta is equal to one, the security, actually, I shouldn't say it ranges between plus and minus one, but we do have some benchmarks. So the one benchmark is that if beta is equal to one, that means the security is just as risky as the average stock or as the market in general. And so if, it's, if the beta is greater than one, it's riskier than the market. The beta is less than one, it's less risky than the market. And so betas typically range between not plus one and minus one, but 0.5 and 1.5. You can have a neg negative beta, and that's the subject of this question, but it's not the norm, but we will see that in this example that we've been working through. So yes, you can have a negative beta, and so that's typically going to happen when you have a negative correlation between the stock and the market, like we're seeing with collections. So if the correlation is negative, that means the regression line is going to slope downward, because that's all beta is, is a slope coefficient. And so that's going to make beta negative. But again, not very likely. In this class, we don't need to calculate betas. Um, <clears throat> but beta is calculated through regression. So here's a regression line that's been fitted to match this particular data for the return on the market and the returns on a particular stock in three prior years. And so the line that fits through those three points, so you can see one point way down here and then the other two here, this is the line that fits through those two points. And so it's got a y-intercept of negative 2.59, so you see this SML crossing the, this axis at negative 2.59, and then the 1.44 is the slope. So it's a positive slope indicating that the security market line is sloping upward and 1.44, the actual amount of that slope, indicates the steepness. So now let's look at the betas for this three for high tech collections and then T-bills. T-bills is going to be flat because there's no risk. High tech has a beta of 1.32 and collections Again, it had that negative correlation, so it's going to have a negative beta, and therefore a negative or downward slope. So here are our expected returns that we calculated earlier, and now we're, we're given betas. Again, in this class we're not calculating them, so these betas are given to us. So riskier securities have the higher returns, and now they have the higher betas. So the security market line um, is that line that we were just referencing in the earlier curves. And so if we assume that our yield curve is flat, then that gives us a risk-free return of that T-bill rate of 5.5%. 
So that means the risk premium on the market, which is the market return minus the risk-free rate, is going to be 10.5%, which is our market return, minus 5.5%. So we get a risk premium of 5%. So the market risk premium, remember that is the additional return that we get for taking on risk. And so how much of that market risk premium depends on beta. So if we have an average, uh, a stock of average riskiness where the beta is one, we're going to get the full 5%. If we have a, a stock that's riskier than, mar than the market, we're gonna get more than 5%. If it's less risky than the market, then we're gonna get less than 5%. So market risk premiums tend to hover really closer to this 4% than the 8%. So our required rates of return then are going to be based on CAPM. And so remember, it's the risk-free rate plus the market risk premium times beta. Market risk premium doesn't change. It's 5% for everybody because it's the market return minus um, the risk-free rate but the beta is what changes, and so that's the only thing that changes in all five of these calculations, and that's what's driving our required return. It's the riskiness of the stocks. So here are our required returns for all five stocks. Well, the three stocks plus the market and um, T-bills. So notice that the required return on the market is the same as the expected return because it's got a beta of 1. The required return on T-bills is the same as its promised yield because there is no risk. Now, required returns are the return that investors are demanding given the riskiness of the stock. And so now we can take that required return, which in this table is listed as R, and compare it to our expected return from those original forecasts. If our required return is lower than what we're expecting, then that stock is actually undervalued. We should be paying more given the expected return. So high tech is undervalued because we only require a 12.1% return, but we're actually going to make 12.4. The market is always going to be fairly valued. T-bills are going to always be fairly valued. But in this example, U.S. rubber and collections are overvalued because we require a return that's higher than what we expect to receive. So now if we put all of this together on the security market line, anything that's fairly valued is going to plot right on the security market line. So we have the market and T-bills plotting on the line, and we have high tech plotting above the line because it's undervalued, and collections in U.S. rubber plotting below the line because they're overvalued. So we're not getting as high of a return as we should because the security market line is fair. Above the market line means we're getting more than we should given the risk, and below the security market line means we're getting less than we should with respect to return. So for our equally weighted portfolio, what is our portfolio beta? Well, now we're back to weighted averages again. The Portfolio beta is the weighted average of the betas of the stocks in the portfolio. So if we've got our equally, equally weighted portfolio of high tech and collections, high tech had a beta of 1.32, collections had a beta of negative 0.87, so that gives us a portfolio beta of 0.225. And our portfolio required returns is the weighted average of the returns of the securities in the portfolio. So we've got a portfolio return of 6.625. We could do, we could also calculate it using CAPM and we'll get the same result. So what could change the security market line? Um, in this case, we're seeing that investors raise their inflation expectations. If you raise inflation expectations, that's the one thing that's going to affect the T-bill rate. So that's going to raise the T-bill rate by that amount that the inflation expectations went up, and that will shift the entire security market line upwards. Now, if investors become more risk averse, that just means that they're going to demand a higher return for the same amount of risk. So that's going to just um, not kink the line, but just shift it 
upward, so not parallel, but it's going to stay at that same intercept, the T-bill rate, but it's going to shift and become more steep. So just some last minute notes about CAPM. Um, it hasn't been verified, but basically it's the best model that we have to explain um, or predict market returns. And there's just been lots of studies about CAPM where people try to say that it's not the best measure. Um, because we're concerned about market risk and total risk and is it measuring the right things but again it's the best measure that we have right now so some people create models that add other elements but for our class we're just going to stick with the basic cap in